Uh, well, I'm excited about the topic tonight, uh, about the next generation. And when we think about the next generation, um, we probably uh, have many different thoughts going through our heads depending on who we are this morning. Maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're a pastor, a youth pastor, children's pastor. And, uh, and we come from different sort of contexts. And so when we think next generation, certain things pop into our heads, particularly in the type of world we live in, where communication connectivity is so spontaneous, but it's also um, in many ways uh, very uh, sensationalist, as we know, in public media. So you never really quite know what people are thinking about the next generation. Um, I, I, I received word actually uh, right before I came over here, our office, as Rob said, is here in South Florida. It's right on the border of Fort Lauderdale and Pompano. And it's uh, actually right on I-95. For those of you that don't know 95, it's one of the busiest corridors in, in North America, freeway. And I received word that there was a high-speed uh, chase this afternoon. And uh, the car was going at super high speeds and was getting away, I guess, from the police, the pursuers, and uh, came off of the, of the side, the shoulder of the road to get through the traffic, came sliding through um, the, gla the, the grass on the side, went through the fence that bordered our property, crashed through the trees, and smashed into three cars on our property right before I came over here. And they actually found that the, that the, that the trunk was filled with shotguns. And so we have a school in our building. Obviously, people were concerned. What does this mean? What kind of world do we live in that something like this could even happen here in South Florida? So that's the news I got. Obviously, I was concerned what happened and was asking all these questions. We're not sure yet. We'll let you know. They let me know a little while later what actually happened. It actually was an 80-year-old man who had a seizure and went through, and it wasn't shotguns in his trunk, but actually his walker. So the actual story <laughs> didn't quite correspond with the reality, uh, and so are the, the sensational story that I heard. Such is the world we live in. <laughs> what really happened? And uh, it's kind of like that old game we used to play of telephone where you whisper it in one person's ear and by the time it got to the end of the row, it was a completely different story. Well, that is the internet on steroids of how communication is happening in our world today. So when we hear next generation um, and we think about what we see in the media and what we hear in the news, but oftentimes even what we hear in, uh, in our neighborhoods or even in our own families, some of the stories that we hear about this generation are very sensational. And they seem in many ways like very dangerous stories, which they are. And so uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for, for Rob's leadership. I'm thankful for his intentionality here at Coral Ridge and particularly the long history of Westminster Academy, which has dedicated itself to making sure that we spiritually form the next generation, which I believe with all my heart is the greatest call and mandate on the Church of Jesus Christ. I experienced the love of this community myself. I grew up on the mission field in Beirut, Lebanon, and then in France before coming to South Florida as a missionary kid, um, and this community embraced me. This church loved me. Westminster Academy has so much to do with my spiritual formation when I had come back from uh, the mission field, where as many missionary kids, I, I encountered what is called a uh, re-entry culture shock. I had culture shock about how to grasp what was going on in American culture what the worldview was of this new society that I was now living in. And I really think I could have had a tragic late teen years if it hadn't been for my teachers, and for Dr. Wackus, and for Pastor Kennedy, and so many others that helped me understand the world around me, but most importantly, how to apply the gospel in the context of the world in which I was living. So I thank this community. And it's that very topic that I've been asked to, to speak on today. And that spiritual formation and theology that was formed in me actually has a lot to do with my leadership at the Ministry of One Hope. It has shaped me in so many different ways. So this institution's belief, not only in the spiritual formation of children, but importantly and especially, I think that 
this place understands that the lifeblood of the church's vibrancy and vitality to not only survive but to, to thrive from one generation to the next. This foundational truth that we find in Scripture from the creation of the family to the establishment of a covenant that is laid out in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, that we as his people would love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength, and that the actual prescription for maintaining this covenant was that this command of love would, number one, be impressed on our own hearts, and number two, impressed on the hearts of our children. And we see that in the entire meta-narrative of Scripture, from the patriarchs to the judges, to the kings, to captivity, to the climax of Scripture that comes through Jesus himself, to the early church and its beginnings, and the instruction for us today as his new covenant people. The formula for not only maintenance and survival, but for spiritual, social, and cultural thriving, and to live out a public faith, and for us to declare the lordship of Jesus Christ in all of life, it hangs on this principle of us understanding this generation and knowing as God's people what to do as we receive understanding of what this generation believes and what they're thinking and what faces them in the culture that they live in. That dictate and command for a wholehearted commitment to impress on our children and our children's children a love for God. This is the promise of the covenant through all generations, including ours. And I'm here tonight at the outset of this gathering and this conference to ask a a sincere question. And I'm asking this tonight not only as a father and a grandfather myself, with two grandchildren being raised in New York City. And in fact, Kim and I, as we were headed out the door, got a video from my oldest granddaughter uh, announcing to us that our third grandchild would be another little girl. But I'm also here as a practitioner of the gospel that's tasked with leading a ministry whose mission it is to equip and supply the global church with what they need to help accomplish this precise outcome. And then our latest global research study, as as Rob mentioned, our Global Gen C is the largest uh, data study of this generation that exists on a global basis. It was conducted um, amongst uh, representative sampling in 14 languages, 20 countries, and it really has given us a deep understanding of today's teenager and their beliefs, attitudes, and worldview. I just re- really recommend to all of you to, to, to download it. It's being made available for free to you as a, as a resource. And it is global, but um, I, I, in particular tonight, is, am just going to focus on the North American data that faces us in that report. And I have to say the, the findings are sobering. In fact, the first time I read the initial report on North America, I, I, I was in tears, I was moved, I was broken knowing that this is the environment and the situation that my Zoe and my Jude and my grandchildren would be growing up in, and in New York City and sort of the epicenter of it all. And so uh, we look at these numbers tonight, and they can be overwhelming and sobering. But it's important for us to truly understand where the baseline is and to be honest with ourselves about the culture that now surrounds us. Um, Of American teenagers, 57% of them now self-identify as Christians. That number has been dropping precipitously over the last 10 to 20 years. It's at 57% today. Of those American self-declared Christians, only 8% can be considered committed to their faith, or 4% of the total population of young people in our nation. This criteria for commitment, you might want to know what it is. How do we define what a committed Christian young person is? Actually, it wasn't a very high bar for it. It was 
four core fundamental beliefs that you can see there on the screen and two consistent behaviors. Daily, uh, weekly Bible reading and a weekly commitment to prayer and four foundational orthodox beliefs that we have as an evangelical community about the inerrancy of scripture, the saving power of Jesus, the inerrancy of God's word. These principles that we, that are in this room and that are listening online right now have based our faith on. And that's the definition of a committed Christian. Our study also validated that what many in an older generation have feared about this generation as we have looked at the news and followed what's happening, um, some of our fears that surround things like marriage and family and that these sort of worst fears are in some ways being, being validated by the data. Uh, do they believe marriage is defined as a union between a man and a woman? The majority of self-proclaimed Christian young people would say no, it's not. Are concerning gender issues and whether it is based on a biological sex or whether it is a more fluid concept determined by my own personal beliefs, the majority of teenagers today would actually hold to that belief that truth is actually relative to what I believe and that I have the ability to self-identify. And again, this just isn't among children that have no faith. This is about among the majority of our, of our so-called Christian young people. We see in our society and in our life um, a growing mental health crisis. I'm sure we've all read about the higher depression ranks, anxiety, and suicidal ideation of any generation in American history, with one in four of our responders stating that they have contemplated suicide in the last three months. That number in our data seemed maybe exaggerated. It couldn't be true that actually one-fourth of American young people have contemplated suicide in the last three months, but actually all the validating research that we did in our peer review validated that. And the more we started doing qualitative research and focus groups, that was concerned. We are in the midst of a great moral and mental crisis amongst our young people in this nation. And before I jump into some maybe more depressing findings that are coming out of this report, I have to just continue to say we have to look at the data. We have to realize that um, pornography and sexual practice is actually self-reporting Christian teens are more actually sective, uh, sexually active than, than other faiths, are the so-called nuns, those young people today that 27% uh, of them that would say that I have no faith at all or I have no beliefs, or I'm an atheist or agnostic, they actually have, they're actually less sexually active than those that consider themselves Christians today. These are startling statistics. But in the midst of all of this data, in the midst of all of these findings that we have today, there are actually places for us to identify some hopeful points for us to act on, that we have a responsibility to to understand where these young people are at and how we can properly and effectively minister to them. When we ask teens, what is the most influential voice in your life? The majority of young people today overwhelmingly said their parents. More than their peers, more than social media or their education system. I go to my parents when I have questions about what is right or wrong. I go to them about what is the meaning of life or religious matters. On every single issue, this was the case. Young people were saying, by far and away, statistically, my parents are the most influential voice in, in my life. And as we did qualitative research, the parents said, are you kidding me? I am the most influential voice in their life? I feel like when I'm talking to my 13-year-old, he doesn't even listen to what I'm saying. Parents, grandparents, youth pastors, children's pastors who love your kids, they are listening to what we are saying tonight. And they are needing the message that we are here to proclaim to them in this next generation. And when we, when we did qualitative research among those teens and asked them, why is that voice seemingly so powerful in their lives when they're surrounded, some of them with exposure of, on an average, 13 hours a day of exposure to the media outlets and technology that is around them, they said, well, that's where we might spend our time. But we know for ourselves that we have a false identity on social media ourselves. We paint a picture of ourselves that actually is not authentic. So how could we touch our friends? 
to give us a true picture of what's really going on. We see the agenda of the educators and the politicians and, and, other, and other people that have agenda. We can't trust their agendas. We don't know where to turn, but actually we are looking to our parents for the answers that we need in life. I don't know about you, that gives me great hope tonight. But it also is a, is a call to us to do something about it. All these results that I just mentioned to you are strongly corroborated by other studies that have asked how does faith pass from one generation to the other. I'm really looking forward to reading Rob's dissertation that he's completing right now and handing in on May on this very subject, on cultural impact in the next generation. And every study that I've read, whether it's Vern Bankston's study, uh, which is a longitudinal study over many, many years on intergenerational faith, or our Christian Sp Smith's study of um, the next generation, the NYSR, the National Youth Study of Religion, or the Pew Research that focuses on the next generation, all this data confirms that the greatest determinant of resilient faith has been and still is parents, which is why this covenant in Deuteronomy is more true today than it has ever been before. And it's a call to us tonight. So if the realities of this generation strike you as particularly scary, the good news is that the greatest answer is actually sitting right here in this church tonight. That we, the parents and grandparents and family, have a greater influence on our children's beliefs and behaviors than the culture does, than society does, than the internet does, or that their peers do. If that is the case, then this most important question that we have to ask ourselves this evening are in this conference is why? Why, if our influence is so high, are the outcomes so bad? So Carl Truman points out that every age has its darkness and its dangers. And the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and respond appropriately to them. One of the most uh, startling findings in another study that One Hope recently conducted with Barna um, that, is, that is available to you as well tonight that you can download and free to you is called Guiding Children, which uh, is where we studied um, how digital, this ge digital generation was what they believed. And so in Guiding Children, it pointed out that 97% of Christian parents today um, are satisfied with their child's spiritual development and formation. That's almost 100%. Almost 100% believe that I'm doing a good job with my kid. Yet, when you contrast that with 59% of young people that temporarily or permanently disconnect from church and their faith after the age of 15, we better be asking ourselves, why is it exactly that we are satisfied with our parenting? Why is there such a dissonance here? Do you get that this is, to me, the greatest challenge and the greatest concern and question facing the American church in the early 21st century? Why is it no surprise that we have not just lost, in many ways, the culture war that is before us, but more importantly, why have we lost and are continuing to lose the hearts of our own children and our grandchildren? So the question before us that we should be pursuing is what do we do about this? How do we solve this problem? And we need to be very careful at this point to, to properly interpret the data that we have before us and digest it properly because we could take the information we've just heard and we could very easily misinterpret and misuse it. And we see this happening quite a bit. The danger could be that we believe that we are primarily fighting a war of ideas in our culture and that we are fighting 
primarily a worldview itself. And if that is all that we take away, I think that we could falsely assume that the primary task is just doing a better job of communicating truth. That we will have, that we re, what we really have in the church is maybe just a, a messaging or a, or, or a marketing problem that faces us as we come up against these powerful media and, and, and social influences in the lives of these children. Maybe we just need to do a better job of building better communication vehicles or programs built around truth. And if, if we just had more doctrine and theological um, training, possibly, and maybe if we package that better, then maybe we could change things. And as one whose credentials in life's work speaks for itself on these issues, I'm, I'm here to declare to you that that is not enough. It is not nearly enough for us tonight. That the primary problem is not just figuring out what information and curriculum we need to teach or to, 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 to weigh in on with this, with this present uh, toxic environment and culture that we, society that we live in, to focus on the battle between what we see going on in the news or the press and, and respond to it emotionally um, as emotionally as, as the rest of the nation is doing. And whether that response comes from Christian nationalism or whether it comes from a new social activism or progressiveness on the other side and the toxicity of all that rises up and we want to respond by doing something. And oftentimes we look for answers that are, are, um, are packaged to us in the type of lives that we're living. But more than being a a, a marketing, our packaging, our program development problem, this problem, this battle has to be perceived as a personal one for us. That it will only be won by intentional discipleship and spiritual formation in our homes, in our churches, and in our schools. Turning the hearts, as the prophet Malachi says, not just the heads of our children. And it's not in finding better programming or a silver bullet, quick fix, five-step, six-week curriculum. And this coming from a leader whose ministry builds more scripture engagement programs than any other organization on the planet. You see, the primary problem that we have before us tonight is the same age-old problem from age to age. That's why from the beginning God made it so clear to us as his people. You see, the primary problem is repentance and turning our hearts to love our God and being so in love with Jesus and serving him so authentically that the contagion of this truth that we love and believe are so impressed on our hearts that they are naturally, continually impressed on the hearts of our children. That's why I believe Jesus is so emphatic when asked this question, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Paul picks this theme up in addressing the church in Corinth who find themselves at a similar context to the one that we are actually facing here in our country right now that we are living in. He's talking to this church, a wealthy society, sexually obsessed, polytheistic, multiculturally diverse, hyper-pluralistic, and committed to a ruthless relativism to accommodate all manner of Hellenistic schools of Stoics and Epicureans and Platonists and Cynics. In fact, his truth claims have been, truth claims of Paul have been vilified, and his apostleship and authority are being questioned by the Corinthians to undermine his actual credentials. They're demanding Paul to build a case for himself and for his message. And in fact, that he should actually provide for them, these are the exact words, with letters of recommendation to prove himself and his teachings before this church that he planted. Paul turns their argument on its own head by pointing out that they themselves are his proof. That according to Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, that God has written his love letter on their very hearts. That 
the proof lies in the fact that Jesus himself has transformed their very life and his message and his power is actually all that is really needed. The answer seems too simplistic. In fact, it might even seem too simplistic for us in this complicated world we live in tonight, but the answer is still the same. From age to age, it's always been the same. What Jesus did for us and his message and how we impress it on the lives of our own children is what will transform this world. He clearly delineates the old covenant being built on laws and commands that was glorious but inadequate. And this new covenant built on Jesus and his spirit are more glorious, actually more personal, Paul says, more powerful. And this new way is made possible through the paradox of the cross, turning the Corinthians' concept of what glory really is and and success on its head. He not only provides the the way to salvation, but he reveals Jesus' character as as the model, as, as, as a model for each of us tonight. That model of of love that he defines in Christ Jesus, self-giving, sacrificial love, incarnated in a cruciform way of living. This is the call that Paul says will overcome all of the wickedness, all the sin, all of the various beliefs that exist in this complex society. Paul is saying, by all my decisions, actions, how I live and lead, I am imitating Christ's cruciform lifestyle. Cruciform life is a way of actually coming alive and doing life in the place God has planted us in. It is more than a program. It is not just offer us tips or techniques. It is not something you do only on Sundays. The cruciform life is this day-to-day lifestyle of gospel-driven love for God and for everyone that we, especially those that are closest to us, that we're called our family, our children, our grandchildren. And the climax of Paul's instruction harkens him back to a theme in his first letter which declares that Christ's death and resurrection, the gospel itself, is more than more advice or a recipe for spiritual growth and success. It is God's loving, transformational plan for all of humanity. And I really believe that American evangelicalism has reduced this message of the gospel in many ways into this moralistic, therapeutic deism or as an alternate socio-political construct for us to follow rather than the glorious, all-encompassing love of a God who is here and ready and available for us to pass his message on to our very own children as the only hope they have. His promise of abundant life, an invitation to join him in the restoration of all things that he created. That's why Paul can say, faith, hope, and love abide. And the greatest of these, Paul reemphasizes the teaching of Jesus, is love. And herein lies a practical framework for us tonight to employ for this generation, for our own children this evening, across two decades, and having spent literally millions of dollars on this research in every region of the world, committed Christian youth, this is what we have discovered, that have a vibrant and resilient faith, this is what it was boiled down to, rests on a, on a three-legged stool. As we studied the characteristics of committed Christian young people that were living vibrant lives, that hope that all of us have for our own children, in our families and in our churches. We found that in all of our studies, in every region of the world, in every country, in every language that we studied this, there was a a trifecta of three things. And those three, you couldn't take away one of those things and the stool still stands. You had to have all three of these. And those three things have remained consistent. The trifecta of spiritual vibrancy is family, scripture, and being part of a missionally accountable community, the church. Family, scripture, and church. These three pillars provide the foundations that establish truth, meaning, 
and authenticity for a generation lost in a maze of confusion, hopelessness, and loneliness. Faith. Faith, the construct of truth. And knowing what, why, and how to believe. Without a commitment to scripture engagement, today's youth are drowning in an ocean of moral relativism that promotes a narrative of literally personal self-determination. This this, this belief, an expressive individualism where so-called personal authenticity is discovered and molded through my own inward desires. This is the worldview of the majority of American young people today. This postmodern philosophical worldview is so paramount in today's modern culture that it transcends any scientific or common sense. Rather than being formed in the image of God, we form our own image. Rather than a biological identity, we choose our own gender. It's why the insanity of toddlers choosing and teens surgically mutilating their very bodies is no longer seen as an abnormal activity, but a majority of belief among self-identifying Christian youth today. And I believe that what we have is what the theologian Walter Brueggemann has described as a faith widely held but so greatly reduced that it has no power or potency for life itself. At One Hope we believe there is a need for deep, robust, meta-narrative scripture engagement where God's word is present as a holistic story that encompasses all of life from the youngest possible age and at every level of a child's cognitive ability and spiritual formation. That first stage of biblical literacy as an outcome for one to six-year-olds. Do they know the stories of the Bible? Are we ingraining those stories of Scripture into their lives to heighten Bible literacy before the age of six years old? Moving on to biblical competency from seven to 12-year-olds when children begin to actually build competencies of comprehending the Word in light of the questions that are being asked of them. People say seven or or, or eight or nine-year-olds, isn't that a little young to be comprehending Scripture and knowing what answers to have? Friends, if we start any later than that, it's too late. They not only need to understand and have biblical literacy, they need to have biblical comprehension by the time they're 12 years old so that they know these answers to these questions. And then moving on as society are, are, are presenting to them as teens, so that they have biblical influence in their life. From literacy to comprehension to influence, as they begin to impact the culture rather than being impacted by the culture. This is why we see in the Jewish faith that age of 12 years old is so central to them cognitively. That a Jewish child not only knows the beliefs of the Jewish faith, but he knows how to properly articulate them in front of the congregation so that when he's faced with those same questions in life on the street, in the university, in the school, he has a prescient answer for what is going on in his life because it's deeply ingrained in him since his childhood. Friends, the church has to take this seriously for our generation. We created tools, programs for, for, for all these different stage groups. We created the Bible app for kids, for two to six-year-olds, for them to learn the stories of the Bible on their mobile devices. People say, well, you know, should our kids be on on devices? They're gonna be on devices. Let's just answer that question right now. We're not called as God's people to run away to the hills. We're not called to be defensive against culture only. We're not called to assimilate into culture. We're not called to remove ourselves from culture, but God from the very beginning has commanded us to be a faithful, loving presence in culture. And it's our job to be able to raise our children to be able to navigate what's going on. And the only way they can navigate it is the roadmap God gave us his word in the Bible. Kids Bible experience that we developed. By the way, kids Bible experience, 62 languages now, 72 million children that are engaging with scripture from two to six years old on these devices right now around the world. 
The Kids Bible Experience, which we just launched in April, now has 2.2 million American children that are engaging with Scripture on a daily basis on their mobile devices through the Kids Bible Experience. Our Feed Catechism for Youth. There are many tools like this that we've created to try and establish God's Word and truth and faith in this next generation. And there are so many other programs and tools that have been created that are, that, are, that are incredible. And these all are there to fortify our children and bind these stories to their foreheads and to the palms of their cellular hands so that we can continually talk about these issues on our commutes, around our tables, and by their bedsides. Faith. Are we called to ingrain faith in the lives of our own children and the children of the communities that we live in? Faith, hope. Hope. Hope is a quest for meaning. This generation has been called the most cause-oriented generation in the history of humanity. Seth Godin, the great sociologist, um, has popularized, he doesn't call them Gen Z, he actually calls them Gen C. And he has three C's for this generation. Catastrophes, connectivity, and causes. Born on 9-11, gone through the economic crash of 2008, having gone through COVID, connectivity, the most connected generation in all of humanity, about to enter the third wave of digital transformation, Web 3.0. If you thought Web 1.0 and Web 2.0 have fully made our lives invasive with technology, get ready for Web 3.0, which is coming down the turnpike right now. Connectivity, this is a connected generation. And he said the third C was actually uh, ecology. I think it starts with an E, but, but what he really means isn't just the environment, that's his cultural worldview. What he means is a cause. This generation of young people so knowledgeable is looking to make a difference in the world. But they cannot find meaning in a post-truth world. This culture, laid by a foundation of, of French enlightenment, where I grew up and went to high school in France, of humanism, added on by the nihilism of, of Nietzsche and so many others, in which human beings are called to transcend themselves and be superhumans, to make their very lives, they're told, to be works of art, to take the place of God as self-creators and the inventors, not the discoverers of absolute truth and transcendent meaning. No wonder they're suffering under mental health issues. God never intended for them to carry that as his creation, but that's what everything in culture is telling them where they'll find meaning, is to produce this out of their own selves. The problem is that most of what we call evangelicalism doesn't answer these questions that are, that are being demanded of them. We actually launch into our answer before we listen to the questions that are being asked of them. Dallas Willard is expressed through his writings the concern of having become more interested in getting decisions than making disciples. As N.T. Wright proposes, we have become primarily salvationists, not evangelicals. Proclaiming the gospel in its fullness, I fear, as Willard says, we are making it more about sin management than we are what I believe it is. The holistic answer for everything that allows us to have a life of abundance, abundant life, because we know who we are and because we have just fully discovered who he is the fullness of the gospel for all of life. Willard says it is a view of the gospel that we are proclaiming here in North America that gets us perhaps ready to die, but, for, prepares, but, but leaves and provides one unprepared on how to live in the present or to know the purpose and power that God has given us to help actually transform and bring healing to a broken world. How do we as parents provide meaningful hope for our children? How does the church prepare our young people for a life of mission that will take on and transform what's broken in our world today? Faith, hope, 
planting a vision in our children to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to bring meaning into a lost world, to bring salt into a world that has lost all of its savor, to bring light into the midst of darkness. This is our role as spiritual fathers and mothers of this community that God has entrusted us with. Faith, hope, truth, meaning, love. Intentional, disciplined, and selfless love that Christ portrayed for, for us. UCLA's freshman survey, which has been longitudinal over many years, includes responses every year from 150,000 full-time students from more than 200 different colleges and universities around the nation. They found that the number of first-year students who spent 16 or more hours a week hanging out with their friends who, um, sorry, that those 200, out of, those, out of all those students who spend, who on average spend 16 or more hours a week hanging out with friends fell by nearly half over the last 10 year period to just 18% of their time. That same sur uh, survey found that 41% of students said that they presently feel overwhelmed by, quote, all I have to do, and log the highest levels of unhappiness ever recorded by college students since the surveys started several decades ago. How is it possible that at a time where access to friendship is at an all-time peak, when adolescents are less encumbered than ever before by the demands of perhaps family or work, they're more connected by technology than ever before, that more than half of young adults entering in as freshmen into school feel left out, isolated, and quote, anyone that I can have a meaningful conversation or believe that I can actually talk to about important issues. The study concluded that Gen Z is in fact the loneliest generation in US history. The study showed the problem isn't that you spend all of your time alone, actually, or on screens, but rather you spend most of your time with peers, working, running meetings, producing plans, training your bodies, involved in sports activities more than any other generation, busier than any other generation, organizing and studying. Gen Z as a culture are actually hyperactive and super goal-oriented. But the reality is that in the midst of all of this social media, virtual and real-time connectivity, there is little or no meaningful connection taking place. The study found that 69% in this age group feel that the people around them were, quote, not really with me, and 68% of freshmen going into college felt as if no one really knows who they are. Some 96% of parents told researchers that moral character, this is, this is secular, not Christian parents, 96% of parents told researchers moral character was essential in their children. But more than 80% of teens and their parents said, said their parents were valued achievement for their personal happiness more than anything else. What every child wants most, what every child wants most is to be loved. What of our highest priority in all of life was to love our children. And our greatest commitment was spending meaningful time with them. What would that do to the nature and makeup of the church? What kind of influence do you think those children would have upon this most lonely of planets? I love this quote. The general human failing is to want what is right and important. But at the same time, not to commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right. 
and the condition we want to enjoy. This is the feature of human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life. We avoid that life that would make it a reality. At the end of the day, these are not statistics that we've been talking about tonight. These are real lives. These are our children. They are God's children. Are they our priority? And for myself, even though I work with these issues of reaching the next generation with God's word every day of my life, and it's what our family has been committed to, my greatest commitment is to my grandchildren in this moment of life, that Kim and I have committed to drop everything else in order to implant the good news into my Zoe, into my Jude, and that newborn baby that is in my granddaughter's belly right now. They are our number one priority. And God has called us not only to our own children, but to all of his children. I was driving right down the street from where I am to my headquarters at One Hope one day. And as I was driving there, um, I always like to take that time to spend in prayer and, and, and sort of calm myself down before hitting into the rush of the day. And it's my time to listen to a little worship m music. And that's my routine. And I, I drive the same way to work every day. And on this one particular day I was driving, I was praying, and I was stopped at a red light. And, and oftentimes when I'm when in, the, in that time of prayer, I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and hear if he has anything for me that day. And he did that that morning. As I was sitting there at the red light, I heard him say, Rob, take a right turn. And so I thought, okay, Lord, take a right turn. Take a right turn in my marriage, take a right turn with my kids, take a right turn at One Hope. And I really felt the Lord say, no, dummy, take a right turn at this red light you're sitting at right now. <laughs> I took a right turn, and I found myself driving through a neighborhood that I'd never been through before. It actually was right across the street from our global headquarters at One Hope, the one that, as you've just heard, has reached 1.7 billion children around the world. I was driving through that neighborhood, and it was one of those moments where the Lord just sets you up. Have you ever been in a moment like that? And that day, in this short few blocks that I drove through this neighborhood where I've ever been, I, 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 saw, I saw a drug deal go down on the side of the road. I saw a transvestite prostitute walk out in front of my car. I looked over and I saw moms whose children should have been in school that weren't in school. And I pulled the car over to the side of the road as I experienced this. This was not a barrio in Nicaragua. This was not a slum in India. This was literally right across the street from my own house, from my office. I pulled the car over to the side of the road and I was literally broken for those children that I'd never seen before. As I was there in intercession, I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for seeing children around the world, but not seeing the children that are right here in front of me. That neighborhood was called Avondale. I made my way into the office that day, and I, I actually told my team, I said, guys, I need you to stop what you're doing. I know you're busy. We've got a lot to do. And I told them the story of what I just experienced in that neighborhood. And we made a commitment that day as God's people to God's children. That was 12 years ago. One Hope has a lot of responsibilities around the world, but through our por partnership with Coral Ridge, for 12 years, we have been investing in the children of Avondale. 600 of them now go to school in our building, in our charter school. It's a public school. There are certain things that we cannot do in that school, and we don't. You know what we do? We show them the love of Jesus every day, and we make ourselves available to them, and we meet the needs of their family and their parents, and we serve them in the way Jesus Christ has asked us to. 90% of those children matriculate into a Christian middle school. 
that Coral Ridge helped sponsor for us. Every one of those children in that middle school have now accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Friends, this is not an impossible dream. This is something that is available to each one of us if we'll lift up our eyes and reprioritize and say, what is my role as a father? What is my role as a grandfather? What is my role as a neighbor? And we can stand on God's word tonight. From age to age, he is still the same. His covenant is alive today. And all the lies that we see persisting around us, make no mistake, they have no hope. They will fail. God has promises. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ. But in the meantime, may we do all we can to be prepared, to be committed to taking this good news and providing it to every child that we can in Jesus' name. Lord, we come before you tonight as your children. And Lord, we, we do take a moment in the spirit to lift up our eyes to a world of children. Lord, in a, in a room like this and those online, there are parents and grandchildren and, and grandparents tonight. They're not necessarily thinking about the children of the world. Perhaps, Lord, they're thinking about their own children that perhaps seem far from you tonight. Lord, we stand on your eternal promises tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bring faith to the heart of a praying mother tonight to know that what she planted in his heart and that good news and that truth, that that child as much and as hard he tries to run from it, your Holy Spirit, even tonight as we're praying, can awaken in him the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we have faith tonight in your promises. And Lord, I pray that many of us in this room tonight would take a right turn. We would take a right turn, Lord, to be able in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our schools, in our volunteering, in our churches, to be able, Lord God, to impart faith, hope, and love in this generation, and that we would see not only their lives transformed, but we would raise, begin to raise a generation, Lord, that would so impact this hungry and lonely culture that we will see this kingdom become the kingdom of our Christ and our Lord, and we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Would you say amen with me tonight? Amen.